Hello, this is Tony Kelly. Welcome to Birmingham's Breakthrough TV, Our Health is Our Wealth Show. Good to be back. And I have with me my special guest, Dr. Melrose Stewart, MBE. I mustn't forget the MBE, it's very important. <laughs> it is indeed a pleasure to have you in the Birmingham Breakthrough TV studio. And our paths have crossed quite a number of times, Mel, um, Dr. Melrose Stewart, I should say. Um, and so here we are meeting again. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Tony. It's a pleasure and it's an opportunity to share some of what I know and for us to discuss some of the issues around what's affecting us as black people. So for me, this is such an important moment. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Looking forward to it. So before we talk about mm -hmm. your health and your passion for the subject, health and physical activity, um, Give the viewers and listeners a sense of who Dr. Melrose Stewart yeah. is. Okay. Right, so here we are, a 66-year-old black woman born in Jamaica of, from a very humble background. Um, I am a mother, I'm a grandmother, I have three children, I am married, um, and I have been in this country since the age of 11, so a very long time. I've spent most of my education years here in the UK, in England. Uh-huh. Um, would you like to go a bit more into the education side of things? Oh, in oh terms gosh, of, yes. Um, um, not primary school, but yeah. more, more high school and tertiary. Actually, I will start with my infant school okay. because if, it is... It's a wish. It has made such an impression okay. on me. Those were really seminal parts of my education because I think that grounded me, those early years grounded me in who I am, in terms of my health actually, because I know that around me was a community who were really dependent on the land. And the land was where we got our food, which nourished us. We didn't have much money, but lots of family and community support. So in Jamaica, in Charlton, St. Anne's, Garden Parish, um, I started my infant school days and I came to the UK age 11. Now, again, that was a critical moment because I left Jamaica right at the point where we were taking scholarship. And for those of you who are born in Jamaica, know Jamaica and know the Jamaican system, at 11, it's a scholarship system where if you pass, you go on to high, high school. school. If you don't pass, then you go on to another school, but it's not of the same caliber as some of the high schools. And my mother, who had left us in Jamaica, um, came here and my father were here, said, don't bother with the scholarship, just come because you're not going to be going to school in Jamaica. So I came at age 11, bang into the 11 plus here, knew nothing about it, Tony, absolutely nothing. I remember being put in a B stream because that's who they thought that's where I belonged. And I took the 11 plus. I didn't know I was taking the 11 plus and I passed the 11 plus. And I got a place at a grammar school. Well done, well done. From grammar school, I went on to um, School of Physiotherapy in Bristol. From then on, well, we can talk more about that later. Oh, all right. And it's that Jamaica not bringing, because you said you took the 11 plus soon after you got here, yeah. which just shows you how important the education in Jamaica um, prepared you for um, taking and passing the 11 plus. I say that time and time, time again, again yes, Tony, yes, yes. because they had such an excellent system of education. And it's not that I was in a school which was privileged. I came, as I said, from very humble beginnings. And it was the average school's alpha school in, in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And we did our maths, we did our English, we did the usual topics. But yes, this was March. The exams were in March, a few weeks later. So I sat a maths exam. I sat an English exam. They even told my mother to buy a green gabardine coat because a green gabardine coat was from the secondary modern school. That's where they expected, <laughs> they expected me you to, to go. go. But, but you've proved otherwise. Good on you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned your family. Yeah. Um, let me just come straight into the pandemic, yeah. COVID-19, yeah. etc. Yeah. We were in a lockdown period for quite yeah. some time, for March. Yeah. How did you as a family cope during that particular period? Okay, for me, I think we did well. I don't know what it was about us as a family. Certainly there were stresses. There are all the stresses around us about what's going to happen, the unpredictable. But my daughter, my youngest daughter came home to stay with us and it gave us family time. It gave us bonding time. Um, I loved the quiet, 
I loved the peacefulness. I loved that there was no cars. I don't know whether it was such a, a, a huge halt in our lives that it made us stop to think. And it certainly did that for me. Um, it gave me time to start regrouping what is important in my life. And I recognize that in that situation, I was privileged because I have we have a reasonable home where we could find our own space. We weren't on top of one another. We could find our own office space. We had a very good system of getting down to work, as we always did, meeting at lunchtime, working and then evening, then dinner together. And that was just, for me, it was a positive. But I recognised just how awful it was for a lot of our community where the children were having to be schooled at home by parents who had no insights into what they needed to do. We know that mental health for a lot of our young people, it was a huge struggle. We know feeding the kids, putting food on the table every day, that was a struggle too. So I, I do recognize that I was one of the lucky ones um, yes, um, and I had choices, which a lot of people didn't. Um, and so, you, we talked about keeping healthy during that time and as you know i have spent my life trying to stay we'll, healthy we'll come on to for health. a lot of reasons Indeed. and that was built into our routine, routine. Right. during that time you mentioned work mm -hmm. um and office space mm -hmm. and work mm -hmm. um tell us a bit about what is your work and professional okay. background because right. up to so now we, we haven't touched on that now so here okay. you go so here i am um a chartered physiotherapist that is my main line of work i qualified in bristol in 1976 and i have been a practicing chartered physiotherapist ever since so um in terms of practice when I qualified, I came to work in Birmingham. I lived in Birmingham and came back to Birmingham, partly because I applied for several jobs. I applied for one in Bristol. I wanted to apply for one in Birmingham. And at that time, the jobs were more available than they are now. I was offered both. And I just thought, whichever one I heard from first, that's where I was going to go. So back to Birmingham, I came. So I was at the QE as a junior physiotherapist, um, the only black physiotherapist from my year. Um, having said that, there was one other person from Trinidad because we had overseas um, individuals coming to train in the UK, but not British born oh. physiotherapists. Um, so I worked at the, uh, the Kiwi Hospital for my junior years. Um, and then I moved on to East Birmingham Heartlands Hospital, um, where I was given a promotion as a senior two physiotherapist. And then, interestingly, I was having a great time looking after students. I loved teaching. I loved teaching students. And one of the teachers who used to visit the students from the school asked me if I was interested in teaching. And I said, possibly at some point, but I was only, what, second, three years into my career at that point. And I wasn't, didn't think I was ready to, but I had an invitation from the principal of the school <laughs> to come for an interview. And I, it was something that you could not forego. It was, you know, it was, um, not everyone was asked to come for an interview. So I did, I was successful. And that's where I began my teaching Teach career. career. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so let's say some youngsters yeah. at high school level, yeah. or even those probably at college level, yeah. are listening to this yeah. interview. Yeah. Um, what advice would you want to give them in terms of going into the career you, path you've chosen? Okay, so physiotherapy is highly competitive. It's one of those careers I knew nothing about. As a student at school, it was one of my friends who said to me, she wanted to be a physio. So I said, what's a physio? And she told me, and that sounded great because it was about getting people moving well. And I thought, well, that sounds just what the sort of things that I might be interested in doing, looking after people's health, getting people active, rehabilitation. And I didn't realize at that time just how competitive it was even then um, but I applied and I got in students who are looking at doing physiotherapy now need a level two. it's on a par with medicine and law at for Birmingham University which is where I uh, I lecture we have it's one of the most popular courses at Birmingham so um, we have about 
80 places and for those 80 places we have over 800 applicants and I don't think that should put off any of our black students. I know our black students are capable. They are equally capable. What we do know though that the system does not serve them well. The system is something that as a black child I had to fight my way through. It's something that kids today still have to fight their way through still get called names, still get put down, still get downgraded for a lot of their efforts. We have a, a scheme at the university, and a lot of universities have, which is called widening participation. Now, for me, it's not about letting in students on lower grades, as it appears to many, because they are not capable. This is in recognition of saying, hey, we know that you have gone through a route where you have been disadvantaged Let's level the playing field here and see what happens. And you know what, Tony? When those kids come in, they fly. You know, a lot of them will fly. They still need nurturing, but the scheme is there to say, let's level this playing field. Let's see what you are capable of. Your teachers are saying, we recognise that you have the ability, but there lies a problem as well because it comes on the, rec um, the um, recommendation of the school. So I worry a little bit who is doing the recommendation and is it still uh, not looking to encompass all of our black students and getting them up, up the up ladder? Here. So um, there is a scheme. So I know lots of black kids out there equally capable. They not they don't necessarily apply for physiotherapy, and I think that has sort of a historical aspect to it. Lots don't know about physiotherapy. I didn't know about physiotherapy. I learned about it after I got into it. The kids who come into physiotherapy either have parents who've been physiotherapists, they've been exposed to physiotherapy, or they have picked up on the way, not from people like myself who've been out there in school saying, look, it's a great career. You know, it gives so many opportunities. You can become a private physio, and they don't know what it's about because there are so many angles. You can work with children, older people, neurology people who've had strokes, and we know stroke is prevalent in our community. Wherever someone moves, there's scope for physiotherapy. So let me then ask you, Dr. Um, Stewart, mm. what about people before they go into this career yeah. doing some sort of voluntary work? Is there scope for doing voluntary okay. work anywhere along the road to, for them to get a sense of what the hands-on so-called experience? Okay, so Pardon the I pun. think <laughs> what you're calling voluntary work is what we call getting placement experience. So getting an idea what physiotherapy is about. Is yes. that where you're yes. coming from yeah. with that? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Again, COVID has put a dampener on so many things because where normally you'd be invited in or you could ask for experience, can I come and shadow, work shadow for a day? I can't see that happening at the moment. That doesn't stop a lot of people. What I say to students, if you really are interested in a particular career, we have something called the web. <laughs> You know, the internet is amazing. You can pick up so much information. So any student who comes to me, and as I say, physio is competitive, and say they haven't had been able to get work experience, that's it. We'd love you to have work experience, but if you haven't, tell me what you know about physiotherapy. Because they're out there on the internet are all the videos of physios practicing, this information out there. I'm out there talking about yeah, it. As you are today on our so head is our web people, show. So I would say come join us because our community needs you we have so many people we have a weight problem in the community we have comorbidities like no other you know and we need physios to give that rehabilitation to show people even those who are well how to have an even fuller life in terms of getting the best out of their own bodies so that's okay. what yeah and um, before i move on to the next question yeah. you mentioned we have comorbidities yeah Break that down a bit yeah, so okay. that yeah, some yeah. of the viewers and listeners who might yeah. not be familiar with um, the term, what are comorbidities? Yeah. Now, I'm lucky, I'm healthy. I have no illnesses that I know of, right? So some people may have one disease. So they may have something like high blood pressure. And I call that a disease because it's not normal. And a lot of our community has high blood pressure. That can itself trigger so many other things. For instance, high blood pressure might trigger a stroke. With a stroke, not only do you have a stroke, but you may have an aged person who, you know, when I say aged, an older person. So in their late 70s, 80s, 90s, who also may have arthritis. Young people have arthritis too. So you could have 
different types of arthritis. You can have osteoarthritis, which is the bone, you know, sort of degenerative type of arthritis, but you can have an inflammatory type of arthritis as well. On top of that, you can have diabetes, as you know only too well. Indeed. You can have a other neurological conditions. And I was mentioning earlier about a very uncommon condition that my daughter had. Mm -hmm. So you can have multiple diseases and some people I sit on tribunals as well and we talk about a little bit about that in a moment where I look at um, appeals from people who are applying for disability benefits oh. and I look at the catalogue and it is a catalogue of diseases that people list that they have and a catalogue of medication that they list and I'm always astonished that oh. in our communities we have so many people with so many conditions taking so much medication where do you start so this is what i'm talking about when we talk about comorbidities thank you lucky stars when you have nothing if you only have one some people have 10. well we're going to come on to what what you do to um, yeah. what uh, what the viewers yeah. and listeners yeah. need to do um to try and either keep the comorbidities yeah. at bay yeah. or at least yeah. deal with them without the mention of all the medication yeah. you, you you said some are on. Uh, let me move slightly on to a subject because I introduced you as Dr. Melrose Stewart, mm. um, MBE, mm. um, member of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on getting Thank that you award, Thank you. Um, which was sometime last year. Yes. Tell yes. us a bit about how did that come about okay. and do you have any thoughts about yeah. it? Okay. So I'm glad you asked that question, Tony, because as you and I know, it's a question that sits very uncomfortably with a lot of black people. This member of the British Empire. Why should we be celebrating empire? And I had to address that question. And it so happened that I had a colleague who was awarded uh, an MBE the year before me, and I had to confront a question with her because she called me and said, Mel, what do you think? And so I had to open my eyes. Well, never really thought about okay. it. I didn't think, you know, because she was astonished. She didn't think she was going to get an MBE. So we sat and we had a conversation. And for people who are listening in, um, it cut to the core with me about whether I should accept or not. And there were several reasons for this. And I had to put pen to paper to talk about reconciling honour with this award. And I wrote, I've written a blog and we'll talk about my, my uh, um, site, my website later if, you want, if anybody wants Indeed, to read it. Yes, yeah? really. It's, it's yeah. melrosestewart.com. So anybody who wants to look at it can go there. But it's reconciling honour with all these atrocities. And I had to weigh up the consequences of accepting an MBE. And at the end of the day, as you know, I accepted because when I looked at who was honoring me, it was my profession. Right. Mm -hmm. There were several people who'd put together a portfolio of who they thought I was and why I deserved to be given an award. And this was kept a secret. You didn't Complete know. Complete secret. I had about no idea mm -hmm. until that letter landed on my doorstep, which had an official stamp on it. I thought, strange, because it has the emblem and all of this. And I, I was gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked. And it asks you to let them know whether you're going to accept or not. Was your husband in on it? Was he aware? He wasn't. He, he, oh, none of which what happened, they ask for information because they're making a submission. And um, they make a submission, but I don't know who actually, I think it was colleagues who made the submission. But they don't know whether I've been awarded it because although you make a submission, you're not necessarily awarded. So lots of people make submissions and people aren't awarded. OK, so they all they did was give the information that was required of them, make the submission and then knew nothing more about it until I was asked whether I'm going to accept it. And then I was told I can't tell anyone. <laughs> Right. Nobody knew, and I had to keep that keep that for two months <laughs> until it was announced officially. Exactly. Uh, right. Okay. Um, so, yes, um, I accepted because I wanted to recognise, in honour of my colleagues, um, the work of physiotherapy, and it was for physiotherapy that I was given this honour. Yeah. I have spent all of my life 
uh, promoting physiotherapy and talking about well, just what a wonderful career it is and what a wonderful profession it is in how it addresses people's movement problems and how it can get people back on their feet or not as the case maybe not everybody can get back on their feet but they can have an effective and a full life and I thought I completely empathize with individuals who see the atrocities that has been meted out to us as people of the Caribbean and worldwide who feel that they cannot associate with this compared to the context in which I found myself where I was saying thank you friends and colleagues for showing me this respect and so I decided there was more reach in accepting the award than not accepting it and so it has proved I my email box my twitter feed my social media just escalated so if I had not accepted, few people, some people would know that I hadn't accepted. Mm -hmm. But the fact that worldwide people then heard about it, either said, sell out. Only one person said that. You're a sell out. I've got that in my wow. social media. You're a sell out. Anonymously. I wish that person would say who they were because I'm quite happy to have that conversation. But everyone else was congratulations well, well, done. well done we're so delighted so pleased you deserve it your inspiration all the wonderful things that i thank them for okay so yeah that's good to hear yeah. now um tell us a bit more about how you look after your health yeah. and how would you encourage others who are less mobile yeah. and disabled yeah. to 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 become yeah. more active okay so as a black person I grew up in a family of people who had high blood pressure. My father had high blood pressure, my mother had high blood pressure, my sister, all of the people around me had high blood pressure. So when, in my 30s, when I had my eldest daughter, I wasn't really that vigilant about my health. As a physio, you, yeah, you know, but you know, there's a lot of health workers who are not particularly <laughs> healthy looking. We know that yes, um, <laughs> because busy lives, you know, take over. They're so busy doing other things. They forget about themselves. I decided, well, actually, I'm a physio. I've got to practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. um, can I prevent getting myself get hard it could be hereditary that was the other thing i don't know with if i lived a healthy lifestyle whether i could actually prevent high blood pressure and i thought well see have a go you know do things to keep your weight down because that was the other thing um that's hard believe it or not i used to diet as a student i remember having my rivita and cheese for lunch <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'm not as slim as i was uh, as a student i was much bigger than i am now uh, after I had my first child, I think that's what did it. I was so busy, I lost a lot of weight and it just stayed off. And I decided that if I'm talking about health to people, there is nothing better than showing oh, them, yes. living the living the life that you're talking about mm -hmm. and showing that it's possible. And Tony, you know, what kept me in all these years, 30 odd years later, still looking after my health, still exercising, still keeping well, was a colleague and I decided we will do this together. We would go to a class and it we went to an aerobics class and we started that 30 years ago she was retired and throughout that time there were times when i didn't feel like it she didn't feel like it we were ill other things came in the way lots of things but you know what because we decided that this is what we were going to do initiative yeah. that kept us going and she yeah. left and retired mm -hmm. i'm still on the road i'm still on the journey i've not got high blood pressure i am I keep touching wood <laughs> Because well, I, I'm, I'm a healthy person. I am pleased to hear that because that's one of the issues that when, when I do my events out there where I'm saying trying to do it on your own yes. can be a struggle. Get one or two other people with you. If you're going on a group walk or so on, who will gear you and g you up and motivate yeah. you. It's so important. Yeah. And when you're feeling a bit down, somebody coming knocking on your door. Hey, we're going for this yeah. walk or this fast paced yeah. walk or this road. Very important. Uh, so, so that I, yeah, I would encourage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me then talk a bit about um, the COVID-19, yeah. which you've touched on slightly. Yeah. Yeah. We know that within Britain, let's just focus on Britain mm -hmm. as opposed to the Caribbean, more black people have ended up dying, have ended up catching the disease, have ended up in intensive care unit, um, intensive care units within hospitals. What are your thoughts on that, Mel? Yeah. Why, why has it affected us more yeah. than any other ethnic group? 
like you, Tony, when I started seeing the figures, the pictures, should I say, coming in on the mm. TV, I was struck. Mm -hmm. You know, people are thinking, but what? But wait. And it kept coming and kept coming. It was more black people. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I think what we have found down the line is that there are a number of contributory factors. Gotcha. There are enormous amount of inter in, uh, contributory factors. But we do know that the people who were being affected by this were frontline workers. Mm -hmm. They were on the coalface. Mm -hmm. They were dealing with, these were people in nursing homes, porters, mm -hmm. drivers, all the people who are in the low paid jobs. But we also had some people in highly paid right. jobs who were being affected as well. So when I saw that the vast majority were people at the coalface, something wasn't sitting quite comfortably there. Now, if you, and a lot of papers have come out since then about it's not about racism. Let's on, uh, on um, just change that a little bit in terms of breaking down what is it then. We know that it is highest amongst people who are obese and with the comorbidities we're talking about. We also think that black and minority ethnic, and we'll talk about that term as well, Tony, because I think it's an important term to either use uh, or disuse. I'm afraid I don't we'll, 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 we'll talk about it because I think it's important for a number of reasons. Um, that when you discount socioeconomic factors, so let's take our surgeon or someone who is you know socioeconomically you know probably in the higher status profession let's take away um that the housing the overcrowding housing let's take away all some of the other factors that we say um are affecting black people there is still something there about health and access to health and health care and nobody can put their finger on the pulse that there isn't an issue around I would say racism still, that is limiting people accessing PPE. We talk, we hear about staff not getting the PPE they want in nursing homes. Some of them are a lot of the socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals in those nursing homes. So they can't access PPE. They are in the lower paid jobs because we know they don't get promoted to the higher tier jobs. So it is not simple. But I think there are factors, environmental, health, socioeconomic factors that are playing a part in all of this. As an individual, I had to do a risk assessment for my university. Yes. So I had to, from, they didn't give me a piece of paper to say do a risk assessment. But obviously they said, if you have an issue, you should talk to your line manager about it. And I had to think, here I am, a 66 year old black woman, babe, that you don't like that term who is at risk because that's what the statistics is telling us but i'm healthy right so where does that put me yeah so i know that there are the black women out there who are not so healthy who've got the comorbidities that may be affected by but by by covid can we just touch on the term bame yeah Tony? yes please do yeah? before i go to my yeah, next question yeah, sure. yes mm. i was having this conversation at a um a conference with some colleagues and all of our uh, much of our literature uses the term BAME yeah, the publications right. in research Indeed. I recognize the intricacies and the problems that that term that brings means. we're talking color here I am mm -hmm. yeah we're talking continent we're talking Asian mm -hmm. or African mm -hmm. we're talking heritage mixed heritage we're talking about mixed groups of people we're talking about a whole gamut of things all thrown into the mix nobody really takes it down to the nub of the problem i'm not talking asian when i'm talking when i say black i need to say to you i mean as opposed to white it's a political term yeah? yes indeed. so 
anyone can take umbrage with that. That's yes. and they can and they should because what do you mean, Mel? I'm talking about that we have a system where there's a white privilege and the blacks, yes. people who are non-white, yes. there is a problem. Yes. So that's where I'm coming from with that. If you want to talk about my Caribbean, my African Caribbean heritage, yes. then look at that yes. because that's what that's about. If you want to look at Africans, then let's talk about and Africa is a continent, to totally you know. Agree. So. Babe, unfortunately, we have to deal with what we have. So when we're talking about research that has been published and they use the term BAME, then we have to use that because that's all we have at this moment in time. But people need to decipher, be very clear what exactly. they mean yes. when they use that term. When I say black, I'm talking non-white. Uh, yes. I, all I right? With you. So I'm talking Well, talking well, well said, <laughs> well, well, well said, um, Dr. Stewart. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you... You have a prolific CV. I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. Um, are you a member of any professional bodies? Yeah, yeah. And if so, okay. which? Um, so, um, my CV, um, where does that? I've done my master's. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I got a master's. I did curriculum studies, by the way. So that's part of my uh, lecturing. My PhD um, was in cultural competence. Funny enough. And this topic, several years ago when I was doing my PhD, this terminology came to be part of my PhD at that time. I am a member of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, which is the sole professional body for the 60 odd thousand physiotherapists in the UK, okay? To be part of that society, obviously you've had to have done the course as a, a Chartered Physiotherapist. And I'm also a registered on the Health and Care Professionals Council. No one can call themselves a physiotherapist if they're not registered on the Health and Care Professionals Council mm -hmm. register. It is there for the protection of the public. Anyone who wants to find a physiotherapist who's authentic and they want to look at their credentials, the first place they should go yes. is to the Health and Care Professionals Council register. Anyone who wants to check me out, type in Melrose Stewart, go to the Health and Care Professionals Council website, put in my name. If I'm not on that register, I cannot be calling myself a physiotherapist. So I know that there's a lot of people out there who are hoodwinking people or calling themselves labels that they shouldn't be using. If you're not sure, just check on the register. Not everyone who's on the register as a health and care professional, of course, people from abroad will come and be registered because they, they can, as qualified physiotherapists, are members of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. The Chartered Society of Physiotherapy is also a union, and I've been a strong part of that union as well. I founded the Black Network, the BAME Network, right. the first network for members in the UK. We have allied health professions like dietitians, speech therapists, podiatrists, all mm -hmm. of those are the allied health professions. None of them had a network. For black people. I started one with the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy back in the 1990s when I was just frustrated with uh, not seeing see anyone that. like myself right, see. and seeing the recruitment into the profession. Mm -hmm. So that is something that um, is now being is growing and I'm so delighted because it has grown in leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. Well that so, sort of answers mm -hmm. um, my next question. I'll still ask it in case you have anything yeah. else to add yeah, to it. Yeah. But it was to say uh, as an advocate for equity, equality, diversity oh, and inclusion. You've okay. said a lot there. Is okay. there anything else you oh. want to add to that before <laughs> right. we move okay. on? Okay, so I'm a member of a Majesty's Judiciary. It means that I sit in judgment on cases. Um, this is something that I started as part, I was um, approached through the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy to see whether I'd be interested in sitting on a panel of judges who would hear the cases of people whose, um, uh, whose um, applications for benefits had been refused. Mm -hmm. So we've all heard of the WP, the DWP, mm -hmm. and some of the decisions that they've made and how people have been left without money and their appeals have been turned down. And so when their appeals have been turned down, I sit at the Birmingham Crown Court, at the, at the courts, not the Crown Courts, the, the, um, court. the County Court. The, um, we have our own courts um, in Birmingham with a judge and with a medical profession and we look at the cases of people who've had their disability appeal dismissed so it's personal independent payments it is now so people have their personal and they come before us and say look this is what i submitted and they may bring further evidence mm -hmm. and between the three of us so for me it's always been part of me equity let's get justice done yes. that's that's part of it i also sit on employment tribunals 
So where there are issues around the employer and the employee, I'm there on the as an employee representative. So equity has been part, part and, and soul of my yes, life. It's osmosis. Mm -hmm. But then it leads me on to say then, okay, um, um, I wouldn't say Jack, Jill of all trades, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. to speak. How do you find time to unwind? What, what are your hobbies oh, or your pursuits? <laughs> leisure, oh, leisure time. I love life, Tony. I love life. <laughs> and, you know, this is what I'd say. T I, I don't know whether I'm just lucky. I'm fortunate to have such a wonderful family. Um, but for me, part of living is to enjoy it. Um, my hobbies are getting out in the fresh air and running. I love running. <laughs> so I, I'm a park runner. Okay, before COVID, every Saturday morning at nine o'clock, across the whole world, actually, there are park runs. There used to be park runs. Anybody can turn. It is such a fantastic opportunity because you don't need any money. All you have to do, you can turn up in your wheelchair. You can turn up with your dog. You can turn up with your the child's pushchair. Everybody, you can walk. You don't have to run. You can come with your walkers. And in fact, one of my most inspirational figures at the park run is a woman and she won't mind me mention her janet she's got her crash helmet on because she has epilepsy she had major in, um, accidents and she's there on her tri walker you know people pushing yes. a walker and there she's going around the park on it so it doesn't matter so everybody all abilities turn so i run i used to run with music because i can lose myself in my reggae music and john holt playing to me as i run is wonderful <laughs> uh, but i can run without music so that for me is good if I can't run, just spending time in my garden. Gardening is the love of my life. I have a lovely garden, mm -hmm. so I can spend time, and I can lose myself all day, every day. In the and are you like Prince Charles? Do you talk to the plants? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, but I nurture them. I, right. I nurture them, yes. I, I don't know whether they'll talk, talk back. They won't talk yes. back to me, but I nurture them. Spending time with my grandchildren. I've got two wonderful grandchildren, age 11 and 6, and they... You know, you know, I've done intergenerational work yeah, yeah, and I yeah. recognize the value of older people having conversations with younger people. Well, I, I think you you mentioned inter intergenerational work. Yeah. You need to tell people because I've watched it about three or four <laughs> times. Please, at yes. this stage, just yeah. mention the, um, the Channel the, 4, the channel four um, which has won awards and so on. Yeah, what an um, amazing program. Yes, tell, tell people so, what it's called so, so they can go on this program that I did, as one, I was invited to be one of the experts on the program for Channel 4. It's called Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. And when I was approached, it was a, because of my passion for health promotion. Channel 4 wanted to present um, um, an investigation looking at what the mutual benefits were for older people interacting with young children. Now, you and I know, Tony, that they warm the heart. Uh, they talk, yes. you know, they, they will drag you from pillar to post. They will keep you entertained. But what hadn't been done was actual measurements of before and during and after. And what I did as a physiotherapist was to look at the changes in the physical capacity of the older people as these children engage with them. First for six weeks, we repeated it, it was so successful. It was, as you know, Grayson awarded and yes. BAFTA nominated and it's gone worldwide. Yes. Um, yes. We repeated the uh, experiment, looking at the mutual benefits for the children as well. Mm -hmm. And as you might expect, it has been incredible. In it outcomes. really is a wonderful program yeah. and I would encourage all the viewers and listeners on Our Health is Our yeah. Wealth to watch that oh, because gosh, yes. um, let's let's face it age um there's young there's middle age and there's yeah. elderly mm -hmm. and um we all are going to yeah. get there some somewhere along the line mm -hmm. um and that that really truly was a remarkable program i Thank thoroughly you. enjoyed and it can i just say tony though covid has stopped some of this interaction but it doesn't have to because we have other means you know mm -hmm. we can use oh, okay it's not the close hugs no. and everything that the children are experiencing mm -hmm. But our older people still need it. Our children still need to bond and hear the stories. So we can write letters. We can do FaceTime. My sister, as you know, died earlier this year, sadly. But you know what? The children came outside her window. You know, she's in a was in a residential setting, and the children are there. They were holding your pictures. That's they done and. Oh, gosh, there's just so much we can do. Let us do as much as we can to stay engaged. Mel, yeah. it's been a pleasure talking yeah. to you. I, um, there are people out there who, when they see this podcast, will say, how can we get hold of Dr. Melrose Stewart? Yeah. Um, 
do do tell us whatever social media yeah. um, so, things you're on. I know yeah. that's the age we're in now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so for me, um, you just have to put in Melrose Stewart. <laughs> MelroseStewart.com takes you straight to my website. It's as simple as that. Okay, so if you want information, MelroseStewart.com, just send me a message. It'll, there's a email page and there's a page on there where you can send messages. I'm very happy to be contacted and for people to ask me questions and to share their stories because I, I this, the website I developed was about health and getting people ready and those who are reluctant. What it is that's stopping you? What is it the, the uh, mountains that you feel you have to climb? Those sort of questions, yeah? So, and also on Twitter. Again, my name, Melrose Stewart One. Okay, and that's <laughs> what I like about you, Dr. Melrose Stewart, is that you're, you're not aloof. You're, you're open to oh, um, be, people coming and getting in touch with you, contacting yes. you and so on. That's what it's about, yeah. and, and being able to give back to your community. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you to leave us with a final message, yeah. looking probably down the camera oh, and okay. telling us, what would your final message be to the viewers and listeners of today's Our Health Is Our Web show? Oh gosh. Over you know, to you. I, I had so many notes on it, I haven't used them at all oh. until just this moment. And you know, I thought I must get this message across because for me, it is so important. And the first thing I would say to people is to love yourself. You know, it seems such a simple message, but a lot of us don't love ourselves. Um, we look at our image in the mirror and we really don't like it. And that's a starting point. You don't like it for a number of reasons. And some, a lot of those things we can change to make us better. But even if you don't want to change anything, your health is your wealth. Yeah, yeah. I would always always say to people make that a priority throughout the years that i've been practicing as a physiotherapist bringing up my children working we've had disasters we've had all kinds of incidences in our lives which have made me down you know um, life isn't all happy clappy we know that there are times you're going to feel no i'm not going out i don't feel like going out today i don't feel like a run don't even talk to me i'm i'm just not in that place health it, it passes one day you know those things passes but make sure that you rise above that yeah always no matter what like some days I feel I can't find time to go out for a run and then I say to myself what do you keep telling people Mel make it your priority put the book down and when I don't feel like it I say to myself what do you keep telling people Mel you might not feel like it go out there just walk if you don't feel like running just walk and you know once I'm out there that's it. So I would say to people, do that. And the other thing that I wanted to say is a lot of people think exercise, doing exercise is the most important thing. The doing. And that's what put people off. Focusing on the doing. And I think I, I read this just recently. It's not about the doing of the exercises. It's about being. And you're an epitome of this, Tony. Being someone who exercises. And for me, the, it just had, uh, it was just a moment for me lots of people want to do exercises and they're doing it but it's not about being it's about you you are someone who exercises because this is how you want to fulfill your health and that is what i'd say to people don't think about doing exercise be the one who's do, you know is living the exercises but you know just started just start and i'm going wherever. to i'm going to add something yeah. to that because we had a sort of a pre um session before we started and you said yourself and your husband and the entire family, a black family, swims. Of course we do. Please. Yeah. Uh, you're my third guest. I've okay. had Madge Milligan okay. Green on. I've had Colin Sims on, two black people. And they both can swim. Now you two, tell the viewers about, because there's this myth out there that black people cannot swim. I don't know where it's come from, but it's still out there. It's a myth. Dis dispel it for it's us, a, please. It's a myth. It's a myth. I'd like you to dispel there, there it. Is, there is nothing about our anatomy or our physiology that says we can't swim. swim. Mm -hmm. You know, look at our body. Our bodies are built in the way of everybody else's bodies. We can swim. My family, my children were in the water before they could walk. <laughs> right? They were in the swimming pool and swam from school days. And we're still swimmers. Everybody in the family. Swim. There's this issue around hair. You know, black women in their hair. I've got black hair. My children had black hair. We just built it into the routine. On a Saturday, 
swimming day, washing hair day. Yeah, After yeah, swimming, yeah, the hair yeah. gets washed. It's done, Problem. dusted. Problem. Everybody, every week, swim. And so for me, and so many children drown in Jamaica, mm -hmm. surrounded by the water. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult, really. You need a patient instructor and time with someone who understands the fear that goes with some people in getting in the water. But everybody can swim. Everybody can swim. Uh, Use a flow to begin with, yes. <laughs> if you need to, but get in the water and just be that black person who d helps to dispel the myth. Okay. Mm. On that note, Dr. Melrose Stewart, yeah. I, I, I could have you on for another half an hour <laughs> talking. It's been fascinating yeah. hearing yeah. your journey, all of what you're doing and what you will continue to do. Thank Thanks you. very much for coming into the Breakthrough TV yeah. studio, our Health is Our Web show. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you, and I still have so much more I could have said, but <laughs> <laughs> that's for another day. TBC, to be continued. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Tony. And likewise. Thanks to our sponsors, the Afro-Caribbean Millennium Center, New Style Radio, 98.7 FM, Breakthrough Media, and Breakthrough TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Breakthrough TV. Breakthrough TV.